Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Corporate Scrutiny Committee for the 5th of September. Just want to remind members that the meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. Apologies. We have an apology from Councillor Ben Price, and we also have uh, what will be an apology. Um, Councillor Coates needs to leave at set approximately 7.30 this evening. Do we have any other apologies? I'm not aware of any. No, okay. Thank you. Moving on to number two. With the minutes, the minutes of the previous meeting were held. Uh, that meeting was held on the 13th of August, 2024, uh, and are here for approval. Would anybody like to move those minutes? Uh, Councillor uh, Jay, and do we have a seconder? Councillor Wells. All in favour? Okay. Thank, right? yeah. Thank you all. Uh, moving on to item three, declarations of interest. Does anybody have an interest they'd like to declare? Uh, that looks like a no. Thank you. Moving on to item four, update from the chair. Um, I was going to remind everybody again about the training session um, being delivered on the 16th of September uh, by the LGA. Uh, there's also a member peer coming from another authority. Um, so for that scrutiny training on the 16th of September by the LGA, it would be great to have as many members as possible attend. And. Uh, that's it from there. Don't have any specific updates uh, regarding that um, or anything else. On number five, responses to reports of the Corporate Scrutiny Committee. Um, got to say thank you to Councillor Wells, uh, who attended camp Cabinet uh, last week in my absence while I was on holiday. So I think you did a sterling job presenting those recommendations to cabinet and got over the feelings of the scrutiny, uh, corporate scrutiny committee as well. Um, and I'll hand over to you, Councillor. Did you want to say anything? You don't have to, but. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the only thing I'd say, um, and I'll, you know, I've always tried to be constructive on the leaseholder issue, should we say. Um, and I'm only saying this from the point of view of what really has been the last 17 months or so of leaseholders um, unaware of what the next step of the process is and the journey. There's clearly a lot of a stress there. And I think any opportunity that we can take as a council and certainly from the controlling group and the executive to put at ease those fears, um, any opportunity to do that is certainly looked forward to. Uh, I do believe it would have been best at uh, the cabinet meeting, the last one, to at least talk about some of the recommendations that certainly were directly affecting uh, those leaseholders. Um, there were clearly a, a few recommendations. I don't, I understand there is cabinet next month and obviously those recommendations will go to cabinet. But on just a couple of those, uh, specifically around about putting at ease the um, question of uh, renewal uh, over, uh, sorry, um, remedial works over renewal, I think it would have done a lot to actually express an opinion just on that singular issue and hopefully to some extent put a closure to what has been, uh, quite frankly, a nightmare for many of those leaseholders. So I was hoping for a little bit of that uh, as, as an exec executive uh, committee, um, you obviously wield, you know, a good amount of uh, clout and power, and you need to remember that, you know, you are you are in that position, and you can make a difference just by, you know, having uh, an opinion and talking about it. So, um, don't worry, I'm here to work uh, collaboratively. I'm not having a go at anyone. I've spoken separately to the portfolio holder. Um, but it's just an opinion that I have that it could have been mentioned, those recommendations, rather than just, 
you know, the two that clearly, obviously, you would have had to come back on in terms of further investigation, the plain English one and the um, payment one as well. But the other ones, I would have preferred a little bit of dialogue. Okay, moving on. Um, item six. Uh, there is no uh, matters referred to corporate scrutiny from the Cabinet or Council. Um, so I guess we'll move on to item seven, uh, which is the Marmion House reception and committee meeting. So I might as well hand straight over. Um, we've got obviously the leader of the council here, um, Councillor Dean, and uh, the assistant director for people, Zoe uh, Willicky. And if I want to, if I can hand over to one of you two, that would be that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Smith. I'm going to hand over for the um, Marmion House reception part to Councillor Smith. Thank you both. Uh, I'm here to propose the recommendations of reopening the Marmy in Front House desk to the committee. On the doors, as I'm sure all councillors have experienced in recent elections, residents are consistently complaining that the council seems to be closed off to the public due to the lack of a front desk. It's something that the people have asked for, which is why we've made it one of our election pledges in the recent local elections. This is echoed by the council's own research, the corporate plan priorities consultation that took place from the 25th of July to the 27th of August. 23% of people have said that their most important priority was regarding council accessibility and communication, with the focus is being based on reopening council offices, improving face-to-face -face services, communication, public engagement and accountability. The front desk, if reopened, will not only be used by council services, but there's also an opportunity to provide a location for the voluntary sector to hold events within the area of the front desk, which will allow the front desk to become a real hub for the town. The recommendations for the opening times of the front desk must also be mentioned. Three days a week at 10am till 2pm and two days a week at 2 until 6pm. This will give us a wide net to capture as many residents as possible to be able to use the service. I'm sure that there will be questions around the TRC and councillors saying that this was a suitable arrangement previously. However, I wholeheartedly uh, disagree. Every resident I have spoken to that was aware that the TRC was actually the replacement for the front desk was not happy with the arrangements. I've had residents tell me how they've been purchasing sh uh, tickets to assembly room shows, whilst residents next to them have been crying um, as they try their best to explain how their loved ones have passed away um, so their council bills can be adjusted. And I've had other similar um, situations where residents have told me that they've been buying tickets whilst um, someone next to them was telling the council that they had lost their home and they'd been kicked out of their home. The TIC is not a suitable alternative. It's out of sight, leading to most residents being unaware of their existence. And it fails to provide the decency and respect for people in vulnerable situations that we as a local authority must provide to the residents of Tamworth. And it's exactly what we plan to do by reopening the front desk. Thank you. Before I move to questions, did anybody else want to speak on that? No? Okay. Um, I think um, I sent an email out yesterday to scrutiny members um, on, on some of these areas. I've been quite neutral, actually, so I'm happy to hear, obviously, the views of members tonight. Um, just one question, one question, don't worry. Um, did this hit the forward plan? And if not, was it a bit last minute? Point of order. Go. Why, why are we moving to questions when we've not heard the whole report yet? We've only heard one section of it. So I think the leader said, calling Councillor Smith for one section only, and then there's still the rest, right? Who was going to continue? I was going to oh, continue. Oh, okay. Carry on. Okay. <laughs> Councillor yeah. well, You're the chair. I was allowing you to chair the meeting. So going on to the um, recommendations for committee meetings to be moved from this building into the council chamber. I think this is an absolutely exciting prospect. It's something that we can be proud of as, as a council, that we're going to make use of the arrangements, the facilities that are already within um, Marmion House. The accessibility will be much better than this building. We will have a bigger gallery for members of the public to come along and be involved. We will have better ICT, 
which is the problem here anyway, and we knew that this needed to be updated. So that is just being done in the Marmion House Council Chamber rather than here. But the exciting bit for me is the prospect of what this building could be. We, we want to look to bring in some people together, people who have interests in the heritage of the town. We have such a lot here. And for me, just to use this building as another council um, meeting room is, is wasting it. I think it could be so much more. And I would like the people of Tamworth to be able to come together and give their views on what this building could be. Thank you. Anybody else on this side wanted to speak on, on this particular agenda item? No? Uh, did you want to just come back on my question, if that's okay? So. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the uh, item was put on the forward plan for the 16th of September Cabinet on the 14th of August. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jay, did you have a question? If we're finished with the report, I've got lots of things to say, but that will be finished. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we, we couldn't be further apart, I'd say it's probably my opening <laughs> statement, um, which you might have expected. You mentioned a minute ago about the town hall being used for only council meetings when it could be used for so much more. Council meetings are only at 6 p.m. in the evening, so the rest of the time it is still available to do whatever you want with. It's not used all day, is it? Right, We don't have people in and out all day, so it's still available to use for other things um, that the public might want to see. Um, you mentioned accessibility and uh, the public space, uh, public participation as reasons. I mean, this building is accessible. There's a lift. Um, we've got public space. We've had We've rarely do we fill it with the public in here, so it doesn't feel like we need to keep, you know, need particularly more space. I think it's a bit of a, I want to try and choose my words carefully to not offend anyone, but it's a bit of a, a disgraceful proposal in my view. Um, in four, four short months, you've, you're showing us you're turning your back on, on Tamil's heritage. Your acquaintance report, you're taking money from a heritage project and spending it on... I say yourselves, but ourselves, because we're all going to use the chamber. So in the budget, there was best part of £700,000 to refurbish, improve and protect this important building for the future. You're now proposing to take that, or at least some of it, or a large proportion of it, and spend it, again, like I say, on ourselves, things like carpet, chairs, sound system, etc. I, I think that's a tough uh, pill for the public to swallow. Um, we had the same argument recently when there was talk about building a new council office. Again, we were against that because we're spending taxpayers' money on ourselves. That doesn't seem right. It's perfectly fine uh, as it is. Um, so I see it as a waste of taxpayer money. Um, also, spending money on IT changes in a building which arguably at the moment would be temporary changes. So that feels like a waste of money to me. Um, not long ago, um, there was, this is linked, by the way, before you think I'm going way off topic. We froze, uh, as a group, we chose to fro uh, freeze the green bin charge, okay? And that was subsidized from reserves. Essentially, we subsidized the cost of that, um, that increase from reserves to help residents during the cost of living crisis. Some members of the committee from the Labour group grumbled about that, about having used reserves. Now this report is now proposing to use a quarter of a, so that from 60,000 you're grumbling about, you're talking about using a quarter of a million pound from reserves to fund reopening the front desk. Um, so that, that doesn't seem coherent to me. Um, the full, full council, so all councillors decided a few years ago um, to look at redeveloping Marmion House, moving out of there, changing staff terms and conditions, moving meetings over here so that we can show commitment to getting out of that building. You're now backtracking on that. So I would, I would question whether this even is a recommendation to Cabinet. Should it not go back, not go back to full council? That's a question with demo services. If full council mandated it, should it not be going back to full council? Um, so it feels like not only you're turning your back on the heritage 
of this town, but you're turning your back on the uh, large project that full council um, was committed to, which is moving out of Marmion House. So anything you're doing there, carpets, seats, sound system, IT changes, etc. If we're committed to moving out of Marmion House, they're all temporary. So it's literally wasting taxpayer money for the sake of it. So I am against it, just in case you weren't clear. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Jay, how much do you say was taken from this? Was it this as a her her you talking about this as a heritage asset, and how much did you say it was? Yeah, so the town halls, the heritage asset I'm talking about, there's almost, uh, I can't remember the exact figure, was best part of £700,000 earmarked for improvements and developments of this building. This report is saying to take from that, it doesn't up to that amount. I'm hoping we don't spend £700,000 on refurbing the chamber, but according to this, you could. And then you're taken away from here. And if we're, you know, we're in this, we're, we're talking about every meeting, there's always a talk of there's a black hole in the future, we need to find savings, and then bemoaning about us using £60,000 reserves last year, and suddenly, there's a, there's a money tree we can use, no black hole now, we just spend the money on whatever we want. Who wants to answer Councillor Jay's questions? Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've tried to take every point as you, you've said it. Um, you say that we only use this council chamber at six o'clock, so you've got all day, but this is set up as a council chamber. My vision would be that this would be so much more that we, the heritage people would be able to use this for something that would be beneficial to the people of Tumworth. We would, it would be part of our heritage trail. We're looking to, to expand on what we've already got we are very, we've got lots of passionate people in this council who, who are really interested in the heritage trail. We've got lots of people out there who I'm sure will want to join with us and bring some ideas forward for what this building could be used for. Um, with regard to wasting money, at the moment we bring staff over here, we get lighting on in two buildings, we put heating on in the winter, and I'm told sometimes from in the morning to, you know, till whenever we go home at half past eight at night. We're, we're double doing for having meetings here when we have staff over the road. People who have access, accessibility problems and mobility problems have got to walk from the car park because we're pedestrianised. We only have a few seats and we, we know from when there was a, a major meeting a few months ago how many people wanted to come in here and be part of that meeting. The council chamber is fitted for it. Um, the money. This IT system in here is not fit for purpose. After every meeting, we get complaints, even from people sitting along the back there that they can't hear. But we also get complaints from people our residents who are watching us on YouTube, that the, the sound and the quality is no good. We need, as we're passionate as a group that accessibility is the thing. We want to make sure that people are able to listen to our meetings, to know what's going on, that they don't miss every other word. So that piece of work needed to be done anyway, but it is much better to be done in a building where the staff are already, they're not wasting 20 minutes a day coming over here. We're not putting extra heating and lighting on. I have asked for the figures and I've yet to see them, but I think they would make interesting readings, the gas and electricity bills for here. Um, you say about doing that work in, in a building which may only be temporary, that piece of work still needs to be done about how long we stay in Marmion House because we've asked the questions and so far, there doesn't seem to be any um, firm plans about Marmion House. There, there was lots of options, but nobody had made any decisions that we would actually go anywhere else. So there is an issue there. And we know we need to stay there for a certain amount of years because of the issues that there are with contracts on the building. So we would envisage being there at least for five years. The way... Um, technology and stuff moves and the amount of time life expectancy things have I don't think five years is is too short a time to do this work um, and with regards to 
uh, it going to full, full council instead of cabinet. I'm quite happy for demo services to come to an arrangement on that and tell us what needs to be done. I don't mind if it goes to full council. I'm quite happy for it to go to full council. Did you want? You covered a lot of what I was planning to say, but I just think you made a couple of contradictory points. So you spoke about how we plan to waste money, but improvements to the town hall would be 688,000. Um, but as you referred to, um, it's only about 250,000 pound for um, reopening of the town hall and the cabinet chamber. And IT services, as uh, Carol just pointed out, Several times you've seen on the comments on Facebook, I'm sure the communications team, if someone was here, they'll be able to jump in and say, um, it's a constant complaint. People, they can't hear us, whether they're here, whether they're, they're, they're watching the meetings online. Uh, people complain that they can't see us as well, the technology which has been proposed, um, it would zoom in on councillors, so that uh, it solves that issue as well. So, yeah, just want to make those points. So... First of all, Councillor Jay, did you want to come back directly on some of those points? And then I've got Councillor Couchman and Councillor Summers. Yes, please. Thank you. So just the last one, because that was a new one I just written down. So you mentioned, that, uh, Councillor Smith, that I was wrong about the figures and that £250,000 £250, is the cost. No, £250,000 is the cost of the front desk. The refurb uh, talks about taking the budget from the 688, which and it doesn't give us a limit. So in theory... You could spend all of it. So, two hundred fifty is opening the front desk only, not the refurb. So, it's already going to be more than two hundred fifty thousand pounds, right? So, just to clear that up. Um, back to the leaders' points. It's all like woulda, coulda, shoulda. It's all fanciful. There's no, there's not, you know, get to see figures. Uh, it could be used for this. It could be used for that. Okay, but that that's not a plan. It could be used for something, but it's not a plan. So, you're proposing to do something, spend hundreds of thousand pounds before you even know what you're going to do with it. That. I mean, that's your way, that's fine, that's, that's the opposite of how I do it, you know. Once you've got a plan in place, if that shows what you use this building for, and it stacks up, you know, statistically and financially, fine, do it. But don't spend hundreds of thousands of pounds, hundreds of thousands of pounds before you even know what you're going to do. Um, you talked about heating and lighting, and, and, you know, and then you later said, uh, I'm yet to see the figures, but it'll make interesting reading. So you're about to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds the, one of the main arguments you gave was about heating and spending money on doubly, you know, heating two buildings and lighting two buildings. Yet you haven't seen the figures. So how can we make it, be making that proposal? And I would suggest that, okay, I haven't seen the figures either, but I'd suggest that it's probably small fry compared to the hundreds of thousands of pounds that's in here. Um, and then accessibility, again, yes, I totally get that, but should it be at all costs? If we look at how many um, residents come to a meeting? How many residents watch online? You know, most of the views online are officers checking the minutes, right? Let's be honest. So if you look at how many residents have watched online and then complained about the, the sound, calculate the cost per person that this proposal is going to give you. I bet if you looked at that angle, you wouldn't do it. You haven't got hundreds of thousands of people watching it, tens of thousands of people watching every meeting, a queue out the door. It's, there is an odd occasion when there's a subject that's um, more emotive and we'll get people in here, fine. But they're few and far between. So we're, you know, I think if you look at it as cost per person for this accessibility, accessibility issue, it doesn't stack up. Did anybody want to respond to those points, Councillor Dean? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just don't understand why you would think having two buildings open at the same time is a good use of money and a good use of the officer time because I understand sometimes we have to double up on officers because somebody has to be here and somebody has to be in the security room. That just seems absolutely ridiculous. And whatever we spend on gas and electric is an extra. Um, I, I just, yeah, I, I, I just don't understand why you wouldn't want to see this being used as part of our heritage trail and for something more exciting because there, there is such a lot going on out there there are so many people who are talking to us about how they want to enhance the heritage offer for tamworth and trying to impress on us as councillors how important and unique our heritage offer is that i i think we really must look 
at getting a group of people together and seeing what this building could be. I just want to clarify a point as well. So the plan, you talk about not having a plan in place. The plan's not necessarily in place for what we do at the town hall post moving meetings, but there is a plan in, uh, in place for both obviously the chamber and the front desk, especially about bringing in voluntary services. Um, you could even hold councillor surgery. So it'll be an area for the voluntary sector to come in and make it a real hub for the town. Okay. Thank you for those answers. Um, councillor Couchman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a few points, and they're mainly to do with the moving the council meetings to Marmion House. Um, first of all, safety concerns. Recently, we had a very unpleasant incident in the town, and the following week, I had a, a committee meeting here. And I was okay, no problem, until I got the police briefing. This would happen, that could happen, this could happen which absolutely really upset me because it made me think about, you know, all we're trying to do here is have a, a meeting and yet we could be at risk. The other th then that led me to think about, it's all right, it's light at the moment, but in the dark, you go down towards Marmion House. What if somebody gets left on their own and they're walking back? If anything happened, you know, we'd say, oh, what a shame and all that, but... We've got to have personal, we've got to be concerned about personal safety these days. The other thing is about disabled access. Right, as you all know, I'm now basically disabled. So for, in order for me to get here, I have to park by the kiosk um, next to the bridge. When that bridge um, is being dismantled, I'm going to have great difficulties getting over here because I'm not, I'm not physically able to walk. Now, I'm not just talking about me, but what about all those members of the public who might want to come and actually see a meeting and they can't get here, they can't physically walk that distance? So you are being, um, if you like, you're not being disabled friendly at all. Yes, we have the access. We have the, the, the lift, that's fine, but it's getting to the building. Whereas people can get off a bus, they can walk around the corner, it's there, right in front of them, and they can walk in and they can use the lift and come upstairs and they can have plenty of seats where they can sit and they can see what's going on. They can also hear what's going on. I have great difficulty sometimes just hearing other members of the committee because this sound system is not good enough. Now, that needs to be improved. Now, whether it's improved here or at Marmion House, the money's still got to be spent. The other thing is the town hall. Now, I've said, you, you've said, oh, well, you need to know what you want to do with it before you actually commit any money. Well, the trouble is, none of you have done a piece of work on this. You've been in charge for 20 years. All you've done is bat away all the different heritage societies come up to you you've ne you never bothered this is an absolute gem if we think i mean w there was a picture in the paper with the the mp and i know other people we have got so much heritage in storage and all it is is in storage now there's so much that we can make of this area we once the bridge is opened up we'll have a view of the castle um, there are areas we do need a proper heritage space. There is so much that we could do, and as Councillor Dean has talked about, a heritage trail. So therefore, we've got to open it up and we've got to look and see what can be done. So I think a piece of work needs to be carried out on that, and then we can see what costs will be involved. But just, at the just end to of the ask, day, sorry, do you, do you have a question, Councillor yeah, Couchman, right. or any points you want this side answering? Right. Um, yes, I will ask them. Will you do a piece of work to carry out to see what we can do for the heritage of this con of this building? And to answer Councillor Jay, whatever happens, whatever happens to Marmion House, the town hall is not a fit suitable venue for council meetings. I'm sorry, but it isn't. Piece of work. Who wants to answer that? 
Thank you. Yeah, as, as I said before, my idea would be that we get all the interested parties around a table and we're looking to see what ideas and what this can be used for. That, as Councillor Catchman has said, this is a gem. That, and when all the work around it is done, it will be even more in focus. And one of the points I asked council officers about was, if we were not using this as an extra committee room, would we then be able to look at some heritage bids to do some work on this building? We know that it, there, there is a piece of work that needs to be done and there's an awful lot of money that needs spending on it. But we as a council haven't got that money. So we need to be tapping into any heritage funds that are out there and grants and seeing if that would come in. I'm not sure they would give us that money if it's an extra committee room. Thank you, Councillor Dean. Uh, should we move to Councillor Summers? Thank you. I've got two very quick questions and comments. First question, is anybody over at Marmion House now? Is it locked up? Who wants to answer that? Um, it is closed now. Okay, so it's not been used, not been heated, not been lit. Nothing in there, nothing happening at the moment. We're here in a smaller building. That's all I wanted to know. Secondly, the figures that have been produced. 44 average inquiries per month at the TIC for council services, correct? Figures for cost per inquiry for the new improved reception desk based on 200 inquiries per week. Is that correct? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thank you. Um, of course, those are projections. But what we do know is that um, through and Councillor Dean and Councillor Lewis have spoken that they've had the predominantly um, focus when they've been knocking the doors is actually that people want to access the building. So that's um, a projection. As you can see in the report, it does say that it can be scaled up, scaled down and um, everything will be constantly on review. Um, and the positions are temporary to actually uh, factor that in. So it, it's something that we will need to review, and we've um, committed to a full report at six months. Okay. So basically, the projections, grossly overinflated figures to justify... Well, for 44 inquiries per month at the TIC, we know, on average, fact, estimated... 200 per week. That's not something I can't say when I'm challenging something. So thank you. That is a gross overestimation. And we had a very emotive, and I would say politically motivated, introduction to the report that went on about things that were said at the doorsteps. Again, all very anecdotal, but don't actually translate into real hard facts and evidence that you can use to justify wasting thousands and thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money. And you can sit there and say until you're blue in the face that everybody wanted it, but according to the 44 inquiries on average per month at the TIC, where if pe more people actually knew the council had services there, then they would have more than that if that was really what people wanted. And it's not really what people want. It's just what you heard when you were telling them how bad the Tories were for not having a front desk. So if you want to get political, I can. It is a complete and utter waste of money to put money into a building which should be torn down. The money should be spent finding better, newer headquarters, better, newer headquarters that we can move into that we can utilise from the ground up and fit out as required. Now, as far as the conferencing facilities go, I've put something better than this together for less than three grand that zooms in on people if you need it to. Those cameras are rubbish. As for people not being able to hear off this system, I've watched the videos back. You can't hear people when they've forgotten to turn their microphones on. You're never going to be able to deal with that unless you've got an ambient microphone in the middle. Again, it's going to be a fortune spent on something that didn't need to be. And as for the fact that this apparently hadn't had anything done with it for 20 years, this town hall had a piece of work done to it that would have kitted it out much better than it was, extended the public gallery and done something, excuse me, hopefully with underneath it to make it useful. Now, I know, as well as I think anybody else, and we've got the maybes, could be's, that this 
we'll probably get locked up and never used again if we move our meetings back over the, to Marmion House. That was the reason we moved in here in the first place, to get it used again. I'm sorry this is a massive waste of money. We know it's probably going to get through on the nod anyway, but there's my position on it, and I'm sure you've got plenty of reasons why I'm wrong. Um, I think uh, Councillor Lewis Smith wants to respond to that. So you mentioned comments about um, wanting to tear down Miming House. It was a previous administration that put the communication towers on top of it, which means we won't be able to decommission Miming House and tear it down for a number of years. Um, the uh, EE, who own the tower on top, um, have the right to renew their contract. So it might be 20 years until we can even get rid of Miming House to start. People aren't aware the TIC was there, sure. You're not seeing that many people uh, use the, the service, 44 a month. People don't know about it. People aren't aware it is there. Also, if even if they were, and we were getting 200 inquiries a week, it's not, it's not an area which is um, really like... Suitable. It's not suitable. It's not suitable at all. People, as I've said, have been buying, sh have been buying show tickets while someone next to them is crying, saying that their family members have died and they're trying to take them off the bills. Obviously, that is anecdotal, sure, but I'm sure that can be applied and um, staff members... Um, from the TIC would be, well, I would have thought they were more than willing to say that they've had many experiences with that. So, also, can I just also jump in really quickly in regard to cost? Because uh, there was a, a question about, well, a statement about cost uh, of the opening of the front desk. Um, so, 8.1.1 cost implications. Total indicative cost to date are £80,000 with the approximate breakdown detail below. Building being just under 50000 IT infrastructure, 10000 ancillary, 20000 And then below that, where you see the Monday to Friday uh, reduced opening times, four hours per day, uh, the £250,000 figure is after five years of running with £13,000 to reopen the desk until the end of the tax year, and then 56, around £56,000, £57,000 to run the desk each year after that. C Councillor Dean, did you want to come answer as well? Thank you. Um, yeah, um, we're bringing this proposal forward. We're not saying this is set in stone forever and ever. We realise that it, it may not work. Who's to know? We only know that we have been asked for this every time we go out. And you must have been told, well, if, uh, uh, I just don't understand why we're getting those queries and it's, it's come through from other people. The work that Christy Timms is doing around the corporate peer review, where she's speaking with stakeholders, there's, is it 25%, 23% of people wanted the front desk opened. There is, yeah, as, as a main priority. There is an issue that we have been told of people who still come to the front doors of Marmion House to find it closed. They, they don't then troop round to the assembly rooms to find where they want to go. It, it just is the right thing to do, and, and I don't understand why you have such a problem with it. We need to spend money on this building to make it fit for purpose, but it, this room is not fit for purpose. We sit in a weird configuration anyway. The council chamber is much better fitted to meetings. It's just the right thing to do, and we are, we are going to give this a go. We're going to see how it works out, but... This will be reviewed on a regular basis. And if it's wrong, then I will hold my hand up and I will say, we got this wrong and we need to do something else. But there is so much potential with opening that front desk again. There are so many other people we could bring in to help make life easier for the people at Amworth, basically, and make sure they've got somewhere to go and some people to talk to. We don't know for sure that we're capturing all the vulnerable people that we need to capture. And opening the front desk, we feel, will do that. Thank you, Councillor Dean. I was going to pick you up on one thing that you said, which sort of did surprise me, I've got to say, which was when you said, who knows if it's going to work? That is slightly concerning because obviously when we're dealing with this sorts of money, especially when we're you know taking it from reserves as well, 
it, it, it is it is slightly concerning. You want to be obviously, you know, 99.9% sure that something is going to work effectively and it's going to be right for the for the council. Um, Councillor Summers, did you want to come back on that? If I could, yeah. So, um, yes, I'm glad you reminded me of the people standing at the counter and uh, giving their problems out. Okay, so you say, oh, they're buying show tickets and they're hearing emotional stories from people. Well, strangely enough, when people are going to be at Marmion House reception talking about what their, you know, their problems that they're having, other people are going to be around them there too. Okay, so they're buying show tickets, but you know they can request privacy at the TIC, and they can request privacy. Well, I'm sure they could. A member of staff isn't going to ignore them if they go up to them and say, "Could I just speak to you privately for a moment?" A I understand that, that there is a room available for that. If they go to Marmion House. People do tend to pour their hearts out when they get to reception and speak to somebody. And they could be, you know, brought round to a room to, to speak discreetly and confidentially. So that's one problem we've identified, that apparently, that exists, that can be solved quite easily. So the second problem, configuration of this room. Fix it then. Don't spend thousands of pounds moving back to Marmion House. Change, get rid of the tables, change it. Do something about this room. <laughs> Why do we need to spend thousands of pounds when we've got a, 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 uh, an easy issue to fix here, when we could just get different tables? It's not rocket science, but apparently we have to open an entire massive building uh, up again that, as I say, needs to be torn down. And regardless of whether the, um, the aerials are on top of Marmion House or not, and who renewed them, and who was daft enough to do that, well, do you know what? We bought a car park back that we'd leased for 20 years, was it? Nothing's insurmountable. Um, you know, they gave up the profit for that, for up at, um, yeah, up there, okay. <laughs> um, to, to, to let us have it back. We paid it to have it back. So, you know, it, it, it's presumably something we could negotiate at some point. And to be honest, reopening it for five years, the way in the way it is, and the maintenance costs that will need to be put into it again to house people, and um, as I, as I've seen somewhere, how long before you bring the uh, the staff back in as well? I'm sure they'll be happy. If you're going to use the whole building, why not bring them back too? Uh, Councillor Dean, I believe you wanted to come back on those points. Thank you. Um, just a little bit about the appropriateness of um, the the TIC versus the new facility at Marmion House. Um, if you've looked at the papers and the write-up about how this is going to work, there will be a triage system so that when people arrive, they are taken to the appropriate place. So if they are in distress, they will be automatically taken to somewhere where there is privacy and they can talk. There, there will be um, different kinds of ways that they can deal with the problem that they, they have. So if they're able to use IT, they will be sent to a desk where they will do the IT and there will be staff there if they're not able to do it themselves where they can be helped. But there will be that privacy element as well without being taken through a building to find a private room. The other element of what you said is, I don't understand why you don't want to see more for this building. Why you're railing against it being more than what it is. But how can it be more when it's a committee room? I, I, I just have so much excitement about what we could do and what and, and all the, the knowledge that's out there of what we may be able to do here. And, you know, we will get this seminar or whatever we want to call it, workshop together. We will be asking people, we will find out what the people of Tamworth, as we are with the corporate plan, what they want to see and how they want this building to be used. Because it's not our building. It belongs to the people of Tamworth, and it's for them to decide what they want in it. And I'm sure they wouldn't pick that it was a committee room. Councillor, if, can, if you don't mind, you just quickly, yeah. why can't that triage system be put in place at the TIC? Easy enough to do, isn't it? Direct you to the right place when you walk into the TIC. Oh, you're in distress. Let's take you to a private room. Again, not rocket science. It's a, it's really a no-brainer. And, and, and as for this room... Uh, saying I don't want this to be more, that's not what I said at all. Um, I do want this to be used. That's why I'm quite happy with us having meetings here. It just needs a few tweaks to make it work. That's all. It's, a, it's as simple as that. And um, let's not forget as well that the TIC was only a temporary home for council front desk reception anyway. 
we were going to have new headquarters um, put something in somewhere more accessible for people to come into and use but no we're going backwards in time dragging ourselves back into the you know into the wonderful 80s where marmion house was king in town and everybody came to flocking to it um pre the it days and phones and uh, actually used it back then not anymore they don't and they never will not in the same way and we could have put all this money into a new headquarters somewhere even in Anchorside, uh, a shop to have a front desk but no what was a temporary solution is going to be dragged kicking and screaming back into the past it is a waste of money okay i Got, did you want to respond to that, or you can merge it with um, Councillor Jay's question? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, similar to what Councillor Smith said, I was, I was a bit flabbergasted by the comment of, it might not work, but I'll, put, I'll hold my hands up and say it's wrong if it doesn't work. This is not your money. It's not, a, it's not like an investment you do at home with your own money see what happens. This is taxpayers' money, hundreds of thousands of pounds. Like, if it works, it might work. I'll, I'll flick the, uh, black, the, the chip and see what happens. It's not your money. Um, Council Smith referred to the uh, antennas being a, a reason why you know you can't do something in that building. As Council Summer said, it's not. It's just an added consideration in those plans. The plan might not be to knock the building down. It might be to refurb it. It might be to do something else. Doesn't mean you have to knock it down. That's just another consideration. It's not a reason why you can't do it. Um, Councillor Dean said the council does not have the money to do anything in this building. It has. But you're taking it and spending it on <laughs> refurbing over there. There's almost 700k earmarked in the budget that went through th last year that you all signed up to as well for this building. So you're saying it hasn't got the money. We all signed off on it. But you're spending it elsewhere um, based on, on feeling. Um, you said we don't want to see the town hall used. Yes, we do. That's why the 700k is signed to make it fit for the future. I'm hoping that before you've done this proposal, you've looked at the plans that were drawn up to accompany the £700,000. Some of them were okay, some of them need more work, but that's a start of thinking for this building. So you're saying there's, we didn't want anything to be done with it. Yes, we did. That's why there was a start of a plan and the money assigned to it. Um, we talked about accessibility, right, as if I'm a big bad Tory and I don't know about accessibility. Well, I've got a disabled nephew, and I know the struggle my sister has to go to get him in and out of anywhere, right? So I'm not dismissing that, but I feel like we're taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut. It feels like we're spending 700, 800, maybe 900,000 pounds here um, for one councillor, maybe two people, I don't know. There must be other alternatives um, for accessibility or cheaper ways of doing it than what you're proposing here. So I get the accessibility, it's very important, but I'm just saying, the cost of doing it, there must be other alternatives. Um, and then final point um, is around finances. So every time there's a meeting about the budget, there's a look forward, and in X number of years' time, there's a black hole, we run out of reserves, and we need to do something about it. You'll have had those conversations already. You are exacerbating the financial issues uh, in the future with this proposal. So. Residents of Tamworth, loads of them are watching tonight, you said, online. Uh, book your seatbelts because services will have to decline because of this. So you spend it on this, you won't have it for something else. There's something we'll have to give later on. So if we talk about vulnerable uh, residents, I'd argue that services will potentially get worse for them because you have to cut things later on because you spent it on a vanity project over there. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jay, does anyone want to come back? Councillor Dean. Thank you. Um, just to say, we are responding to what residents have told us they want. That is the bottom line. We've been told this is what people want, and we're responding to that. When I said, I don't know if it works, we never know if anything that we do works, but we know that people want this, so we have to... Yeah, I just don't understand why you've never been told that. The other issue about this building is, we have been told that there are limitations to what you can do here anyway because of the, is it, is it a li listed stage, whatever, building, there are limitations to what can be done here to make it fit for purpose for us. So it, it's just a no-brainer. So, I'm sorry, I, don't, I really don't know what else to say. We are looking at the best way of going forward for the council and 
it's that spend to save thing. We, we, we don't need this open as another committee room. We need this as a heritage site. And I hope that your group and um, Ben and his group will join us when we put something together and talk about what, what vision we can have for this building. Because as I say, it has so much potential and it could be so much more. And the plans that were going through, I did get sight of them and it just seemed to be meeting rooms. So as I say, I want to see it be so much more and I want residents and organisations out there to be able to come to us and tell us what they want. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Couchman. Thank you, Chair. Am I correct in thinking that a petition that is delivered to the council has to have a thousand signatures and they have to have been verified before they present it to the council? Who wants to answer that? Thank you. Yes, I think that's correct. Right. Yes, that is correct. The reason I'm asking is because last, in preparation for tonight, I went through the whole uh, cabinet and council minutes of the last 18 months, and the only mention of anything to do with the reopening of Marmion House or putting in a proper front desk was a petition I think that Councillor Kingston got. So that showed that over a thousand people wanted, at at then, at that time, at least wanted this front de desk. So, you know, a thousand people out of a population of 80,000. I think I'm being generous with our population, but you get my gist, gist. The other thing is, if this town hall was transformed and became part of a heritage trail, would that not include, increase tourism to this town and therefore bring money into the town's economy for, for the leader? Go for it. Uh, yes, thank you for that. Yes, I was in the meeting where Councillor Kingston brought forward his petition. I can't quite remember why it didn't go through, but it seemed that um, at the last minute it fell. We, um, our group did vote for it because, as, uh, it, as I say, this has been something that we have found all the time, that we have been campaigning that people want the front desk open, so we were very happy to support that initiative. Um, the, the second part about the heritage thing, we really want to see us making a proper heritage trail, a proper link to all the places around Tamworth. As I say, we have such a unique offer here. We've spent lots and lots of money on the castle. We still have a long way to go to bring the castle up to scratch. We know that it's a historic building with lots of problems. And this building is the same. There, there, will, there will be lots of issues here that will cost some money. But what I'm hoping is that we will be able to get look at different funds from heritage um, lottery or whatever funds there are when we're looking to make something different with with this building if you don't want to come back on that at all i'm assuming not does that answer your question yep yep uh councillor summers thank you so the narrative surrounding that petition that was brought to full council was and there was a lot of it going around at the time that there wasn't a front desk service and that ooh, we whip up a storm and say we should bring it back. Strangely enough, a thousand people stuck their names on a signature. Very easy to do that. A thousand people who probably, most of them, have never used the council front desk in their lives and never will, more than likely, because that's just the facts of it. It's as simple as that. And essentially, that's why it failed. I mean, okay, we had the numbers in the room, and yeah, we more than likely voted against it as a conservative group because we knew it would be a waste of money bringing it back, especially when we had other options in the, in the, uh, in, in the fire to, to, to come to fruition. So as far as adapting this room, yes, there are limitations on it, but those limitations were fully investigated in reports that we saw as cabinet members. Quite easy to make the adjustments we needed to get this place up to scratch for a committee room, and it was investing in a heritage building that needed it which is great, rather than a crumbling old building from the 1970s that was built as a hotel. 
So, you know, where would you spend your money? And as for, you know, not knowing that there's a front desk service at the TIC, well, there's another problem we can solve quite quickly. I mean, I was quite, I was quite vocal and banging on about putting a massive sign outside front of my house saying our ah, front reception is now temporarily at the assembly rooms. Yes, okay, temporarily ends up being a longer while than you expected, but there we go. But again, not an insurmountable problem. But here we are, and we've already been told it's pretty much a no-brainer, and it's going to happen. So that's lots of money down the drain. Fantastic. Did anyone want to come back on those points, or are we okay? Um, I've just got a question, actually. Something that was, I think, Tom, uh, I think uh, Councillor Jay brought it up. I'm not sure if, if it was properly answered. Maybe it needs an officer to answer it. But this, um, this was there was a, there, the budget for. I guess this was obviously agreed at full, uh, well, at the at the council level, full council level in the budget. Um, I might be wrong on this, but also. Uh, I believe this issue was it was in March at full council this year. Um, so I'm not sure what how that ended, but was it an agreement that an open reception would be in place or not in place? Do we have any record of that? And how does that square? Thank you, Chair. Um, the agreement was that officers would explore options um, for and a reception. So just to be clear, has anything come back on that at all since, just so we know? Not yet to full council. Okay. Councillor Jay. Thank you, it's linked to your point. So, <clears throat> um, Councillor Couchman mentioned that she went through 18 months of uh, minutes and the last time it was mentioned was a petition last year. Well, I was about to say, the last time it was mentioned was March this year actually, at full council, where your Labour group, I believe, uh, voted in favour as well of this. And um, it said, officers explore options for a town centre location and delivery model to provide long-term face-to-face customer service of Tamworth Borough Council, supporting the strategy to dispose of Marmion House. You supported that. It also then said, uh, agreed that face-to-face -face customer services will continue to be provided through Tamworth Information Centre at the Assembly Rooms whilst options for the future location and delivery model are identified and evaluated. You supported that. And finally, you agreed that front desk services at Marmon House will remain closed. You agreed that in March. You then get elected, and we're now going to spend 330 grand, which is the, just the front desk bit, if you look at the staffing costs and the refurb costs, just for the front desk. 330 grand to reopen what you agreed we weren't doing in March. Now, the petition was mentioned, I get petitions, I fully support it, and if people, if a thousand people sign a petition, it comes in here, it gets debated, that was the whole point, and we did, and we said, let's bring it back in March with a full proposal, and that's exactly what we did, and everyone got on board with it, so we gave the, the petition, it's fair, fair crack of the whip, and it came out with those recommendations which were agreed by Labour and Conservative. Um, like Councillor Summers alluded to, if you ask a customer, if you ask people a question, should the council reopen its front desk? Click, I'll sign that. Should the council reopen its front desk at a cost of £330,000? Oh, and by the way, there's one down there. You might not get the same thousand people click that question. It's a different question. So you can't just make a decision based on a petition. It needs to come in and debate, be debated on its merits. And that's what happened. And that's where we came to these recommendations, which you agreed with. You've now been elected flip-flopping a U-turning on it. Um, I don't know if you want to come back on that, but I was also going to ask, maybe, in, and, and you can answer that as well, uh, Councillor Dean. Um, as this was, I suppose, effectively last time at full council, would it not, and I think you sort of alluded to it before in what you said before, should it sort of, would you be prepared for it to come back to full council? Because something like this, I'm looking at it sort of trying to be objective about it. And the last thing we want to do, certainly when we talk about the kind of figures and the costs that we are talking about taxpayers money you know we don't want to obviously rush that do we so is it something that you might be um you would be on board in terms of coming back to full council thank you um i'm happy with whatever our officers decide on this i know they're looking at the legalities of how this should be done 
um, I'm quite happy, yeah, to debate this at full council because I think it's the right thing to do. And that, that's my bottom line, that I think this is the right thing to do. Uh, Councillor Jay. This is honestly the last thing I'm going to say. Right? I just scroll down. There is another recommendation in the minutes <clears throat> which answers this point for us. A recommendation uh, at that same full council was passed that a fully costed proposal is pre presented to this council at the first meeting in the autumn for this council to consider and agree a way forward to be implemented in financial year 2025-2026. That's what was agreed. So to bring it back to the first one in the autumn. So was that October full council, November? I'm not sure. A fully costed proposal to be the imp then implemented the next municipal year, not taken out reserves this year. Was that was that moved or amended or? It's in yeah, it's in the minutes. It was uh, moved by Councillor Kingston, seconded by Councillor Wadrup. Okay. Did, did you want to? Speak? Yeah. If, if you carry on down, it was withdrawn. If you carry on down the minutes, and then there's the final three recommendations. Okay. Thanks. That's why. That's why you're in that role. Um, I would like. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment from a sort of legal point of view or procedural point of view, whereas, you know, it, it was at full council, does it not need really, I mean, considering we've not had a sort of report back, I suppose, but does it need to go back from, from a procedural point of view? Um, I'm, absent. I'm not actually sure on that, but I think that would be down to the leadership to decide, um, but we can check on that and, and advise. Well, just to kind of outline where I am with this, and I think it's fairly obvious that, you know, you can't really summarise it. I think, of course, Councillor um, Jay and Councillor Summers are strongly against uh, the recommendations in this report. Um, obviously, we have ca Councillor Councilman Four at the moment, uh, as what it appears to be in terms of broad support. Um, I was just going to ask, um, in the sense that it just, with the costs, it just is of concern. Um, I do, I just want to, I just wanted to separate, I suppose. I, I, I don't, I don't want to sort of put views in anybody, uh, in anybody's, um, you know, come across and, and try and sort of prelude what people's views are. But my sense is that, you know, in the end of the day, we do want a full, we do want a reception, we want an offer and I think you know that was obviously agreed that we need a new locate, look, look, uh, location, um, and we want it to be as visual and um, uh, uh, approachable as possible. Um, I do points. I think I think it was Councillor Summers mentioned about obviously you got the fact that you're putting all this money into a building that, at the moment, we've already agreed that there would be a disposal around that. So I'm not sure if I can quite square that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of some of my views. Um, does anybody have any more questions or do, do they want to present their views at all? No. Go for it, thank you. Can I just clarify, there is no decision regarding disposal of Marmion House being discussed tonight as part of this paper. The, this is about reopening reception. The decision around Marmion House and its future use will form part of a, a further piece of work, which I know is underway. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Okay, does uh, Councillor Jay? All right, just in response to that, but the reason it brought in, I mean, we, we did clearly approve, agreed that front desk service at Marmon House will remain closed. So that doesn't say the future, it says that it, it remain closed. That's why I think we uh, referred to it. Okay, shall we move on to, unless you wanted to come back on that at all, no. Um, shall we move on to recommendations? Um, now, clearly, we, we can't really do this on block because there's a lot of, they're, they're, they're separated quite quite well. So, in terms of the subject matter, um, so number one, to reopen the reception area at Marmion House to provide face-to-face -face customer services, which meets the needs of the whole community as follows. And it talks about opening Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 a.m. till 2 p.m., Tuesday and Thursday, 2, 2 p.m. till 6 p.m. Um, does anybody want to move that? So, Councillor Couchman to move. Uh, do we have a seconder? 
Councillor Coates. Um, all in favour? Okay. All against? Okay, that's carried. So on recommendation one, that is carried. So recommendation two, to approve the addition to the establishment of up to two years, 0.92 FTE customer experience assistant and 0.6 FTE customer service funded from reserves. Do we have a mover? Uh, Councillor Couchman, do we have a seconder? Councillor Hadley. Um, all in favour of recommendation two? And all against recommendation two? So that's carried. Yeah. Moving on to recommendation three to redesign the reception area to support the customer service offer which will open within four months of cabinet approval subject to contractors. Do we have a mover? Councillor Coates. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Nocky. And all in favour? Yeah, and all against? All against recommendation three? That's carried. Yep. Recommendation four. Keep forgetting to put my hand up. Recommendation four. Uh, to review opening hours, usage, and customer feedback on a weekly basis with a full review at six months. Okay. Um, who wants to move that? Councillor Wells. Who wants to second it? Councillor Hadley. All in favour? Okay, and who will be against? Who wants to be against recommendation four? And who would like to abstain? Okay, and recommendation five. Oh, sorry, that's good. If it wasn't obvious, uh, recommendation five to continue to develop the service to explore and incorporate co location working with statutory partners the voluntary sector and community groups. Who wants to move? Oh, Councillor Jay. Who wants to second? Counts I just got yours just before, Councillor Couchman. Um, and all in favour? We all agree. It's amazing. Uh, right, okay, that's carried. Um, recommendation six, to continue to deliver the full customer service offer from the Tamworth Information Centre at the assembly rooms during their opening hours. Who wants to move that? Councillor Jay. Um, and who wants to second it? Councillor Summers. All in favour? Yep, just about. That's carried. All in favour. Um, recommendation seven. Nearly there to relocate all council meetings to Marmion House upon completion of the audiovisual technology installation and minor refurbishment of the council chamber, except for civil ceremonies. Who wants to move that? Councillor Couchman and second, Councillor Coates. All in favour? All against? That's carried. And lastly, uh, recommendation eight, to approve the repurposing of capital funds identified for recovery and reset and town hall improvement projects to fund refurbishments to the chamber and Marmion House reception. Who wants to move that? Councillor Couchman, who wants to second? Ooh. Councillor Nocky, and all in favour? Okay, and all against. Yeah, and that's carried. Okay, 
So those recommendations have, in effect, all been carried. So um, I want to thank uh, those that have participated in that. Obviously, the leader of the council and obviously members of the uh, of the committee. Obviously, it was a very emotional uh, subject matter. I'm sure we can talk about it as we see it develop. Um, right. I'm not sure whether that's the end of um, some of your participation. If it is, obviously, uh, you may leave if you wish to do so. Um, okay, so moving on to item eight, which is the ICT strategy progress update. Um, now, just to be clear about this, um, when obviously I proposed this to be on the agenda, I have to be completely fair and say that I didn't actually ask for anything specific, okay? Um, now, obviously I've looked, so I'm not asking, I don't think we should expect specifics necessarily tonight. And of course, if we do want those specifics and further investigation, we can of course ask the officers. Um, but I have looked over the report. It does seem pretty comprehensive. Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, who wants to start this one off? Thank you, Councillor Dean. Thank you. Um, so this is the ICT strategy progress update. And the purpose of this report is to provide a high level, non-technical update on progress against the five year ICT strategy approved by cabinet in April, 2021. So the focus of this strategy, which runs from 21 to 25, is the journey towards digital transformation as an organization, supporting our vision the corporate plan and enabling associated transformational projects to drive innovation, efficiency and excellence across the council. So the upcoming corporate peer challenge has an underlying information and communication technology theme. Outcomes and recommendations from this will help to refresh our ICT strategy moving forward. And I'm going to ask Gareth to talk about the technical parts of this report, please. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so, yeah, the strategy, uh, the current strategy sort of focuses around uh, five strategic themes. So <clears throat> each with a set of activities uh, that contribute to the success of uh, delivering the overall theme uh, and objectives. So uh, we've still got uh, projects and activities uh, planned and in progress that um, are part of this strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just quite noisy. Isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, so saying... Um, the current strategy has still got uh, activities and um, projects in progress, um, so it's still very much a relevant document. Um, so the report detailed uh, progress since inception, uh, which obviously it's a few years ago now, so um, I'll focus more on the uh, relevant uh, recent and planned activities as part of my update. So, um, so the first um, theme was digital by design. So uh, this really um, focused on the journey to modernising and improving our digital offer for customers, uh, moving more uh, contact to digital channels, and using technology to improve our back office processes. So, um, so our portals are really at the forefront of this theme. Um, so the team have made good progress uh, recently. Uh, there's a lot of new processes gone live with um, council tax moves and um, single person discount, taxi licensing. We've moved over 30 forms into the portal as well as part of the website uh, development. Um, all that said, uh, so development of My Tamworth hasn't been as, as quick as we'd have liked. Um, it's proved uh, quite a challenging uh, piece of work over the period. Um, so online process development is quite complex. Uh, it's, it's based on sort of a legacy architecture now, not in line with our strategy. Um, <clears throat> so that will impede our sort of uh, objective to continue digital transformation. So I think to move us forward, um, we're in the early stages of uh, a uh, number of projects working with customer services to modernise our contact centre, customer portal and a CRM. So just to give you a flavour of the, 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 so what we're looking at, um, they're all based around um, an omni-channel approach, so that's sort of managing multiple contact channels. So I think customers are choosing to use various contact channels rather than traditional sort of phone now. So uh, it'll bring all that into, into one place, managing <coughs> web chat, socials, email. Um, we're also looking at, as part of this, as a conversational and uh, generative uh, AI and robotic process automation to see where we can sort of automate those simpler inquiries and, and requests for information, customer signposting, that sort of thing. So just to sort of take the demand off the customer service team. Um, so the systems will obviously provide greater flexibility with um, software-based phones. So at the moment, um, they're quite fixed in the way they work. So that will bring some more flexibility into that. Um, improve business continuity. So 
just moving away from reliance on our infrastructure um, into cloud-based services. So a lot of the systems now are all based on sort of a, a low-code approach, which effectively means that officers can develop workflows and processes much quicker um, and, and, and be done by sort of fairly non-technical staff. So um, objective being to move, to move forward at pace. Um, so as part of this work, we're also looking at uh, document management. So the electronic document management system we've got now is part of that customer portal piece that I just talked about. So um, we're looking to modernize, uh, <coughs> improve integration of that um, and understand what the sort of use cases are, uh, why the use cases are across the council. Um, it's a few other things on this theme. So uh, we're working with um, looking at the housing portal, uh, looking at trying to uh, potentially of integrating self-appointed repairs module uh, and also some new, a new cloud-based service to um, uh, improve housing allocations uh, so understand the benefits and efficiencies of that at the moment uh, imp so hopefully improving the sort of the customer experience when they're applying for housing um, we're making some good progress on um, the environmental health and planning system ashore so planning went so environmental health went live with that in uh, April um, <clears throat> so um, in the first phase so we're um, hopefully going to put uh, food hygiene move food hygiene um, in the, next in the next couple of months, uh, phase one of planning also goes uh, in the next couple of months and then looking to, for a full migration of planning by the end of the year. So this, this uh, is in line with our um, sort of app strategy to move to more web-based applications uh, rather than sort of legacy, a legacy setup. So um, other services are also uh, keen to sort of move uh, into uh, the shore application. So ASB, private sector housing uh, and land charges to, to name a few. Um, just to finish off this uh, theme, we've been working with HMLR um, to transition the land charges search process into their centralised um, service, so uh, that's work ongoing. Uh, and we're trying to just explore better ways of using existing systems to cut down sort of work, uh, manual work with staff, so a couple of examples. Um, uh, online direct debit setup, so that's quite a um, high volume process at the moment, so we're looking to try and uh, bring that into, uh, into a digital setup. Um, and then street issues, so online reporting of that through to the back office team, so um, some automation around that. Um, so just moving on, uh, the second theme was uh, working smarter. So this was really around um, supporting an agile um, workforce uh, and a technology enabled workforce. So some main activities uh, that are going on around this. Um, so there's in in increased uh, use of SharePoint and Teams, so not just for meetings, so staff are starting to use it more for um, collaboration and uh, bringing projects together. So uh, uh, obviously it's cloud-based, that, that brings more <coughs> flexibility to, to staff working. Um, we're going to move all of our shared data into SharePoint. Um, work's just started on that, so we've moved IT data, um, just as a proof of concept to understand <coughs> where the challenges are. Just working on that now so um, in the coming months we'll start to move start to look at moving more service area data um, all our mailboxes are now cloud-based so that's a piece of work we did uh, about 12 months ago um, more recently uh, so we've been developing several uh, cloud-based applications um, so this is in-house development work with Microsoft Power Platform so just give you some uh, some examples so uh, we've developed a mobile app for play park inspection, so the care caretakers go out and inspect the play parks, and they can record the defects and things like that, and they can be followed up at a later date. Um, we developed a web app for ski managers to record resident visits. Uh, there's a diary application uh, for HR, um, and then a, a, a demand capture application for customer services, so they can understand where um, the demand is and then uh, help with resourcing. Uh, and there's a couple of things we're working on at the moment that we're in testing, so uh, a visitor management system for, um, for the post room and then an asset tracking system for street scene. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of work going on in terms of in-house development as well. Um, we started to look at the art of the possible with Copilot, um, Microsoft's AI uh, tool. Um, staff are already using the public version. Uh, um, obviously, it's, it's limitations because obviously the, the data is in the public domain, so... Um, Use cases are fairly limited that, but we've also started a proof of concept with uh, Copilot licensed um, licenses. So uh, we'll see where that that takes us. And we've also got a, uh, plan, um, a workshop planned with Microsoft. Um, this will help us maybe understand where it can help us in terms of uh, use cases to drive efficiency, um, and then hopefully build a sort of plan for adoption. Um, so a few other things in this theme. Uh, we've just um, we've moved in line with our uh, cloud-first strategy, so we've moved 
um, number of systems into the cloud now. So iTrent, um, HR, HR and payroll system, income management, they've all moved into the cloud, um, which has obviously reduced demand for IT teams maintaining those systems. Um, and then just on the immediate horizon uh, in this theme, we've got um, uh, Orchard Housing, which is a system that all of the housing use. Um, we're moving that to a browser-based system again to sort of improve flexibility for staff. Um, MobGov, that's next to be moved to the cl a cloud service, cloud-hosted service, um, with, and the introduction of an app for members uh, to view restricted reports, so moving away from, from the system we've got now to more flexible um, that, that can be used on any device. And um, yeah, we're, we're just about to start a, a training needs analysis uh, across the organisation for Microsoft 365, so we're sort of conscious that there's skills gaps across the council with 365 and, you know, it's a, it's a tool that we should, we should, we should make maximum use of, so um, we just want to understand sort of skill levels and where, and where we can <coughs> direct training. Um, <coughs> and moving on, uh, theme three was um, better use of intelligence, knowledge and insight. So obviously, we know data is an important asset to us. Uh, it's key we sort of make best use of it to understand um, our customers better. Um, so the latest work in this area is more around um, the work we've been doing with Microsoft's reporting tools, Power BI. It, it allows a visualisation of data, bringing lots of data sets together and, 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 and visualising them to <coughs> help inform us uh, on what the sort of data is trying to uh, tell us. So, um, yes, yeah, so a number of things we've done around that. Um, we've developed a dashboard for customer services. So what this does is uh, present um, data from a number of sources, our telephony system, um, and then the customer capture app. So it, it sort of presents it all in one dashboard so they can understand demand, direct resource where it's required. Um, yeah, a number of other things we've done with it around um, IT reporting and, um, and, and for the inspections for the play park system I mentioned. So there's some reporting tools around that. Um, but there's many more use cases for Power BI. It's, it's a powerful tool. I think, um, you know, it's, it's something that we've, we've, we're conscious with uh, trying to upskill our uh, IT staff in using and then sort of push that out to the organisation so we can make more use of it. Um, uh, we've continued to um, achieve gold standard with GeoPlace. So GeoPlace manages the central address database for the, for the country, so uh, it's quite an important service. So we feed into that with all our address updates. Um, so we, we uh, currently ha have a platinum standard, uh, it, and that's, a, that's awarded to a local authority that achieved gold standard for a period of time. So it's, it's, I guess it's a reflection on uh, the work we do to, uh, on the accuracy of our address data. So it's important for us as well because mm -hmm. the address data feeds into a lot of our other systems. So, um, so it's important when customers are reporting issues that we've got accurate address data. Um, yeah, as I say, there's, there's lots more opportunity in, uh, to use data, and I, th I think it will form a key part of our uh, strategy refresh work next year. And then last two themes. Um, so uh, number four was strong governance, security, and compliance. So this was really about um, us protecting ourselves against the ongoing security uh, cyber threat, uh, and then sort of keeping our information safe and secure as we, as we move uh, through our digital transformation and, and start to use more cloud services. Just a quick <clears throat> run through of uh, some of the activities we've been doing. So we now do um, regular uh, quarterly uh, vulnerability scans across our network to identify where there are potential issues. And then we do a lot of remediation work to, to make sure our cybersecurity posture remains, remains good. Um, we just started some work with local digital uh, on, nation, on the National Cyber Security Centre's uh, cyber assessment framework. Again, just to shore up our cyber resilience uh, and cyber posture. Um, we've got some ongoing um, program of uh, sort of cyber security awareness for staff. Um, we had some, and then uh, so I suppose uh, evidence that this is working. We had a couple of um, phishing tests over the last two years as part of our, our compliance. Um, it was targeted quite large numbers of staff. More re the recent one was uh, a lot of the newer staff. Um, and no, nobody revealed any sensitive information despite the phishing test being quite realistic in something they'd um, come, to, come into contact with on every day. <coughs> use of the system, so that was pleasing. Um, and then just a couple of other things. Um, we just completed our information asset register and a uh, record of processing activity. So this, these are things that we are obliged to do with our GDPR compliance. So and it was quite a significant piece of work to bring that together. So that was a good achievement. And then, yeah, just finally, um, which I think will help us uh, cybersecurity-wise, we've got a couple of staff going through um, 
a cyber security practitioner um, accreditation. So that'll help us with our in-house skills in terms of maintaining that cyber resilience. And then finally, um, uh, future fit te technology was the last theme. So really the focus of this was around uh, maintaining sort of uh, modern and flexible uh, infrastructure um, and then progressing that cloud first approach. A couple of recent activities uh, in this area. Um, so we've now got our Azure landing zone. So Azure is Microsoft's cloud service. So um, we, it's, it's basically our data center in the cloud. So um, we've got that uh, fully set up now. That was fully funded by our Microsoft partner. So it's in a ready state for us to start moving some more services into the cloud. Um, we've done some work around identifying what servers they might be sort of the, for the first phase. Um, the first one, the priority is going to be our website. So um, that'll give us sort of 24 seven sort of reliability in terms of uh, you know, available availability for the public. A um, couple of other modernization uh, programs uh, that are just about to start. So um, we've done some planning and design work on refreshing the whole network in Marmion House. Um, so that work will start uh, in the coming months. So that'll bring uh, improved performance of the network uh, when staff are in the office. Now, you know, I appreciate that, you know, there's not, I don't know what the long-term plan is for Marmion, but it's, but it's all been done um, with a sort of one eye in the future in terms of if it does need to be moved at a later date, uh, it has the flexibility to do that. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, on the same sort of theme, uh, new desktop net technology has been rolled out right across the council, so getting rid of sort of legacy thin clients that we use, so this will bring a better user experience for staff when they're in the office and be able to do team meetings, things like that when they're at the desk. Um, we also works underway to modernize the back office phone system. So we're bringing that into Teams. So staff are familiar with Teams now, so it'll give them that landline calling functionality in Teams, which I think will improve the collab collaboration across the organization. So one issue we have is, you know, contacting staff sometimes with, with, um, with, our, with our sort of legacy phone system. So that will modernize all that, that approach. Um, Council Chamber, so we've discussed that with um, the uh, hybrid enabled uh, audio visual system. So that's work I'm going at the moment. And then just to finish up, um, we're just about to upgrade some of our wide area networks. So one of the pieces of work is upgrading the depot connectivity to make that experience for them a little bit better and improve our sort of business continuity. Um, that was it really for the, the, the sort of latest activities on the, the five themes. So um, yeah, so as I say, there's a number of activities that are coming up and projects that will, I think will modernize our IT infrastructure, sort of progress our digital um, maturity and sort of adopt new technology so we can get more out of our data and use that in a, in a more clever way. Um, yeah, that was, I think that's, uh, that's the update for the report. Thanks. Thank you for going through that, Gareth, and uh, Councillor Dean as well. Um, just a quick question, actually. Did you use Copilot to, uh, to help make this report? <laughs> <laughs> not. Yeah. It's fine, actually. I think it's good. You know, I think, honestly, Copilot's amazing, and I think it can be used more often in terms of, you know, a lot of the reports. It doesn't mean it's providing the content for you, but it's, you know, certainly can make it, keep it short and simple, you know, on a lot of them as well. So I think it can help. Um, I've got Councillor Summers as the first question, and then Councillor Wells. Thank you. And, yeah, I mean, uh, just a quick comment. I've been in the guts of a migration to the cloud and Teams calling and SharePoint, and it's a challenge come to the end now, thankfully. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's probably been the best investment the organization I work for has made. So um, right now, I have to bring it up. Uh, it is in the report. It has been slightly tipped over. But did my colleagues to the left know about this? Our council chamber will be refitted with a modern hybrid enabled audio visual system to improve council meeting experiences for both councillors and the public. The invitation to tender is out now with a planned implementation by November. Remind me, what did we just vote on? Whether we should do it or not? Has that decision been made? To quote somebody previously, a colleague in the room, where was the governance surrounding this? Where are the minutes that said this could go ahead without it being you know, voted on and agreed upon that we would be moving council meetings back to Marmion House. Seems the cart has uh, gone before the horse. Does anybody want to answer that? Is it is it an oversight or? The um, tender is detailed in the front desk and committee meeting report as well. 
um, and should the decision be taken that um, the proposals are made in the other report, then um, they tender will be repurposed to actually something would be done here if necessary. Okay, but it's actually set to be implemented in November. It's out to tender already. The decision's already been made and done and dusted. The tenders have come out to um, give indications for how much things are going to cost. Um, they've been evaluated. There's no awards made and no awards will be made until any decisions have been made. Okay, but it does say it will be implemented in November. That's that's what it says in black and white on the report. It will be. Okay. Um, uh, Council Wells. Council Wells, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I've got about four points. Is that okay? Thanks very much. Um, yeah, go for it. Um, I mean, obviously, they have to answer it, so obviously bear that in mind. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah. First, first of all, um, as, a, as, a, as a relatively um, well, as a new person here, I, I, I think that um, from my sort of life experience that um, in terms of scrutiny, I think that IT represents uh, a significant risk and opportunity. Um, to the council. Um, I, I must admit, I'm not an IT professional, uh, and I'm, I'm going to guess there are a lot of people to my left and my right, maybe are not either. So really, my, my first one is, first of all, to thank um, um, Councillor Smith for, for, for bringing this uh, piece of work to us, as, as you said, as a, as a general introduction. But I, I quite like if there was a commitment going forward um, for us to, to perhaps delve into in a bit more detail some of these 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 issues and I, i've got three issues that, that i'm going to go on to so that'll be my four points so first my first thing is can we have perhaps a, a commitment to to come back on a uh, a regulated interval so that this committee can actually uh, be educated well maybe i need going to be educated and we can understand some of those key issues going forward uh, well, I, I could certainly answer that and say, well, yes, we can we can drag them back, <laughs> but I'm sure you'll be happy to come back as well, isn't it, when we get into more specific information that we want. I think it is very really, really important that we do understand these things. Uh, my, my other points was, uh, there's a lot in your report, and, and I'll be honest with you, some of it just floated over my head because, again, it's not my field, but I, I picked out of it and I've tried to do my homework as best I can, and I, I'm going to pick them in order for what I think is important to me at this point in time, because I'm like that um, usability and I'm sure you're doing it I'm sure it's in there but for example I think it's very very important that any systems going forward particularly logging of work I'm, I'm thinking of the from from a basic point of view the old street scene uh, those sorts of things that we have a system which reports back to the people that are logging that to say what the process where we are with that you know whether it's been accepted for work or it's not or when it, we, you're not having it or whatever it is that's one half of it. You also talked about Power BI. I know a little bit about that. And I think that that will be useful for producing metrics to this committee to say, how is that system performing? How are these services uh, performing? So I'd, I'd like to see, I'd like to see that. That's my first point. Is that something that's, is that sort of approach being planned? Yeah, definitely. Um, the work we're doing around modernizing the CRM and customer portal will absolutely uh, take into account um, the process for customers getting feedback on, on, the, on the progress of their uh, service requests. And then, yeah, so it, they all really use um, Power BI as their reporting tool now. And if, if they don't use it, then the data is presented in a way that can be utilised by Power BI. So, yeah, that's something we can do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as a, a colleague to the right um, this evening, I've talked about data a lot, and they're quite right. Um, data is everything, and we need to be, I believe, a data-driven uh, organisation if we're going to be effective going forward. So that's that point. The second one is you, you picked up on um, security. Um, I do know a little bit about security because I, I work in an industry which is security heavy. Um, my first question really, and it, it's something that, that vexes me on a number of uh, things I work on, is uh, you talk about clouds and we all talk about clouds, but actually, where is the data being held? Because there's lots of different types of data. I am guess there's programming data for bespoke uh, bespoke programs, as well as the, uh, the off-the-shelf stuff. Uh, um, where are these things being stored? Because, again, one of the things that has been of concern on, in my experience is if it ends up being offshore or with uh, organisations which 
may go bust or, or, or whatever it is. There's a security aspect about where that data goes. Um, uh, that's linked to, uh, there's a couple of issues around security. Again, it's just for me to try and understand it. Do you, uh, is there a requirement for, for, for penetration testing um, uh, on that? You're nodding, which sounds really good. And you also picked up on the use of AI, and, and I know our chair is very, very keen on those, those, those aspects, but you also said that AI needs to be uh, brought in in a managed way because it is data and it's out there if we give it away, and that needs to be answered up, which is something that's concerned me. So it, I know I've picked up a lot of things there, but if you could talk about where the data is going to be held and the security around that, I'd be really upset me at rest to start off with. Sure. Yeah, so um, all of our Microsoft data is UK based. Uh, the data right. centre we've just been just set up is uh, one of the, in Microsoft, one of Microsoft's UK. I think it's UK South data centre. So yeah, one hundred percent UK based. Um, so taking that a bit further, when we procure new systems or when we when we move things into the cloud, um, obviously uh, new systems are a cloud first strategy. Is sort of um, we take that approach of you know the systems being um, being cloud first. So uh, one of the requirements in there, we always stipulate that um, all the data is UK based. So um, that's one of the sort of um, non-negotiables for us. So, and then as I say, when we migrate services into the cloud, same principle, yeah, UK based data. Thank you very much. Again, it's the worry of a non-expert who doesn't really know these things. And, and, and the final thing, which is obviously important to us, and it goes without saying really, is that, that it's about integration, obviously, uh, that all systems, uh, and, uh, and again, I'm learning a lot of these things here, but w there's different aspects of the council. There's this housing, there's this, there's, 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 there, there is a need, obviously, there for them to be able to talk to one another. Uh, we, we can't allow any barriers to creep into the mix there if we're going to work together effectively, and I'm sure that's covered within there anyway but that, those are the right okay does anybody have any more questions no okay oh councillor jay um <clears throat> so it's a report of the leader of the council but i'm presuming gareth did a lot of the heavy lifting on the, on the report so thank you it's, it's it's a really good report and good presentation um the bit that sparked my interest, same as Councillor Summers' bit, was the, the fate accompli later on, which is, you know, the decision, the council chamber will be refitted, there is a tender out, and it will happen in November, which I think is very naughty. Um, now, Councillor Dean, it, it is your report, and I know you've got a, a good majority now, but do you plan to bypass proper, proper governance in the future, in a dictatorial way like this, or are you, uh, you going to actually respect the governance structures? I think I can probably say that maybe those were the wrong words in the report and it should have said may, could, whatever. And I apologise that it says will because the decision has not been made yet. Okay, thank you for that. Um, did anybody have any comments or anything else they wanted to say? No, okay. Um, Right, okay, there's no recommendations, so there's no point wasting time sort of having a vote on this. I think we're all okay. Um, as we've alluded to before, of course, we'd like to see this come back, but obviously we'll let you know what, what we're going to drill into. Um, uh, if there's any officers at this particular point, I'm not sure again, that wish to leave um, as we move on to the next agenda item, you may wish to do so. Yeah, Oh, um, if that's okay, um, I'm sure it is with most people, can we just take a five minute break uh, before we move on to the next item? Thank you.
Thank you all. We're back. Uh, right, so uh, agenda item nine, a working group update. There is no working group, so we can move on. Uh, number 10 is the forward plan. Uh, obviously, I've looked through it. Um, there are one or two that I've, I suppose I've, I've plucked out, and we can talk about that in the work plan. But does anybody have anything that they want to mention in regards to the forward plan and what's on there and what we can talk about in the future? No, okay. So uh, moving on then to uh, item 11, corporate scrutiny work plan and action log. Um, so I did send out an email yesterday as a bit of a prelude to this. Um, be interesting to know if anyone's got any opinions, but what we're looking at at the moment in terms of the next one, which is October, is um, the leaseholder um, and some of the specific, uh, specific stuff around that uh, looking to come back. Um, and, we'll, and we'll drill into the specifics. Uh, and then the day after that, it's also a cabinet as well, based on the last, uh, the recommendations. Um, so that's due to be on there. Uh, we've also got off the full plan, I believe, the housing repairs contract. Um, I'd like to have that discussed as well. That will be an exempt item. And... Um, Further to that, so that's number two, and the last one was the social housing regulatory program update, again on the four plan as well. So it's three items that uh, we're looking at for the next meeting. Um, and just to kind of expand on the other sort of issues maybe further down the line, um, the complaints, compliments and comments, um, that was seen at the last cabinet meeting. <laughs> and there's an agreement on that, I suppose. Um, this is a bit longer term, I suppose, maybe sort of late autumn, uh, early winter. Maybe we can come back on that and look and see how it's going, get some KPI um, data. Uh, the other one was housing voids. We have seen that before. We know that that's an issue. And again, at some point, we'll need to revisit that and get some figures and see where the data is. <coughs> Um, and then the only other one that I kind of was thinking about yesterday, which obviously was a permanent issue in the last year and, and last year as well, which is mold and damp. Now, corporate, corporate scrutiny has seen that issue. It was also very prevalent at health and well-being. Um, there was also a working group uh, within corporate scrutiny that looked at that as well. And, of course, it was also looked at in the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Board as well. So there was a lot of attention on that issue. Now, from what I've seen, I've looked at the various work plans of other committees. Um, there was a discussion on it, I think, at, was it July, possibly, um, Housing and Homelessness Advisory Board. Um, so it was covered in that, in that area. I do want to make sure that, as a council, we are absolutely focused on this and it's not forgotten. So. I'll be looking to see um, that that is still a pertinent issue. And obviously, if we need that to come back to corporate scrutiny, we will do and make sure that, uh, you know, we can we can improve the situation. Uh, anybody got any questions or comments in regards to the work plan? And as ever, you can always email me at any point. Uh, Councillor Couchman. Thank you, Chair. The only thing I'm concerned about, and I've, I've raised it with my own committee, is the amount of items that we have on any single agenda because to give um, a report you know effective scrutiny we need time and as we've seen like last meeting and this meeting um, and after sort of a couple of hours people tend to flag so I think you know if we can have <coughs> less items but more in depth because I think that's what they deserve so the way I'd respond to that is, I think historically, if you look over the timings of uh, particularly scrutiny, I suppose, they have fallen very well short of what is, I suppose, the two and a half, two, two and a half hours period of time that we are given on this. And I'm trying to move to a situation where actually we do uh, increase a little bit more uh, what is on the agenda. And I would argue the case that if we don't obviously have as much on, then obviously there is less to talk about in effect anyway. So, and there's always the option, if it is the case, that we need to, um, you know, either extend or move uh, on to the next uh, 
available uh, committee meeting. We have got that at our disposal. So I am, of course, maxing this out at the moment. The trigger, I suppose, in the last meeting was the leaseholder issue, which obviously went on for an hour and 45 minutes, which obviously no one could um, potentially see that going on for so long, which obviously meant that it pushed everything forward. So um, I just want to ensure that we do have as much opportunity to talk about as much as we can um, because I think it's you know some seriously personal issues here across the across the board and we need to cover them um, and so that's that's kind of my view but absolutely I'll take it on I know uh, councillor Ben Price made comments last week as well so I do take them on board if Thank I you. can just say that if necessary I think we ought to have more meetings and I know that some people won't like that but in order to do things justice I think and you say you've got a wide remit in this committee that if we want to do it justice then maybe we need to meet a bit more frequently yeah i did actually raise that at the beginning when i became chair and i think we are sort of probably actually quite max, maxed out in terms of the number i think i might be wrong but i think there's a minimum in the constitution is it four or something like that ridiculous four um so you know i just i think that's that's really wrong but um, at the moment, we'll see how it goes. As I said, the leaseholder one from the last one really, really has, has kind of pushed everything and, and, and brought the exempt items into tonight's one as well. So we'll see how it goes, but absolutely, I'm taking your comments on board in regards to the amount. Anybody got any more comments before I move on? Councillor Jay. Yes, sir, I think the constituted four is because it's four quarters, so you'd have an absolute minimum of, if there's nothing to scrutinise, you scrutinise the performance four times. That's where the minimum four comes from. Okay. Uh, Oh. Okay. okay, we can have a conversation offline on that one as well. So, okay, moving on um, to what is agenda item 12 the exclusion of the press and public. Um, so, um, to consider excluding the press and the public from the meeting, uh, we have to pass the following resolution. Um, that in accordance with the provisions of the local authorities, ex executive arrangements, meeting and access information, England regulations 2012 and section 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt um, information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of schedule 12a to the act and the public interest in withholding the information outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information to the public uh, and I request a mover for that please oh councillor couchman I think <laughs> <laughs> photo finish and a seconder councillor Wells uh, is everybody in favour of that yeah that's unanimous Okay, we'll just take a moment so we can...